Well, it's great to be with you all um, uh, out there. Um, I look forward to giving you a quick update on, um, <clears throat> on uh, Virgin Galactic's uh, progress, as well as the spaceship company, and a little bit about Virgin Orbit as well. Maybe we could get the uh, slides to the first slide, I think would be a good start. Um, before I begin, though, I wanted to recognize someone who's in the audience who's a, a good friend and someone who has served the space industry and the aerospace sector as well as the national security community for, by my count, <clears throat> Frank, 47 years. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe it's 48, but um, Frank Culbertson is uh, retiring on uh, Saturday, I believe, and uh, he is, uh, I'm sure, a friend to many of you. Um, and. Uh, a national hero. He was obviously the only American in space during the September 11th uh, attacks and someone who has served our nation um, continuously with dignity and strength for, for decades. So Frank, if you could stand up somewhere out there, it would be great to recognize you. Um, where is he? Over there, ladies and gentlemen. Frank Culbertson. <clears throat> All right. Um, Still not quite at the front end of the presentation. I'm not sure if there's some way to do that, but uh, in any case, um, uh, I'm going to tell you about what we're doing regardless. There we go. That's efficiency. OK. So um, we're going to start the presentation. Now, I was told to <clears throat> talk a little bit about the big picture in the industry before we get into the details of, the, um, of uh, Virgin Galactic. So I thought I'd start with this image. Um, which was, of course, taken yesterday. And while there are those who might say that um, the InSight lander, um, and I would be one of them, is an incredibly important scientific probe, I would say that arguably the craft that took this picture is even more important in the history of space development. And that is uh, one of the um, CubeSats that flew by as InSight landed on the planet and transmitted telemetric data on EDL as it went down. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But this is such an exciting moment for the space community. And sometimes it's easy for us to sort of not really take a moment and reflect on the progress that we've made over the past uh, years and decades. That I thought I'd start off by just talking about the great trends that we see, that we have demonstrated, or that are nearly ready to be demonstrated over the coming years, um, because I think it's important to take a pause before we move into uh, what the future may hold. So, <clears throat> um, progress, all right. So, what are some, let's, I just picked out five major things that I see coming down the road um, before I get into a flight update. <clears throat> and what I want to talk to you about is the revolution that is going on in space technology, particularly in access to space, but also in in-space technologies that are worth mentioning. And these are changes of uh, significance, right? So Launcher 1, um, which is the Virgin Orbit's uh, launch platform, is going to reduce the cost of a dedicated orbital launch by three to five times. So that is to say a flight by itself to space will come down by an order of three to five. That is super important for those who need a dedicated ride but don't need a big lift up to space. That's a crucial thing that is, that is happening. Um, big reusable launchers already have reduced the costs uh, to get to space on a dollars per kilogram basis of, I would estimate, two to five times and may well be on the pathway to two to ten times. That's an incredible advance that is happening as we speak right now. Another major uh, development will be Spaceship Two and, and other vehicles will be able to lower the cost of a human space experience by potentially a factor of 100, going from you know, order of magnitude 50 million to uh, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. That's a major advance that is happening in the course of our career. The cost of a global constellation of satellites is being reduced by a factor of a thousand, what used to cost billions or tens of billions of dollars by the NRO or other agencies is now being deployed for the cost of tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. 
This is a very significant trend and one that we'll see, I think, continue so that that cost of a constellation drops potentially even further than a factor of 1,000. But I want to return to the first picture, which was taken by uh, the Marco uh, uh, CubeSat, a 6U CubeSat, as it flew by Mars. Why is this so exciting? Because it arguably is reducing the cost of planetary exploration, admittedly, just one kind, you know, that which can be put on a few cubes, by a factor of 10,000. What an amazing time that we live in, that uh, a small group of folks from JPL and other affiliated entities can put together a vehicle that can survive in space, in interplanetary space, for many months and uh, do a flyby, do real, uh, a real job, capture imagery um, for a few million bucks. I uh, had the uh, pleasure of spending a few minutes with the guys who were running this um, program a few weeks ago and they told me that the recurring cost of building more of these satellites would be on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and potentially less. Can you imagine what that will mean when we could build, you know, a hundred of these or 10 of these and launch them on a dedicated small satellite launch vehicle or launch, you know, a thousand out to a thousand different destinations in the asteroid belt for the cost of uh, what might be uh, one mission, you know, 10 years ago. The point that I would like to communicate is that big things are happening now, that there is a revolution going on in space, both in space access and in in-space capability. And you all are a big part of that. And we, as a, as a team, as an industrial team, as a government industry team, can take advantage of these trends to bring the benefits of life down to Earth and to advance our reach into the cosmos. When the costs of activities drop by a factor of two, three, five, ten, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, that means that the capabilities are extended to many, many more people and organizations. And that, I think, is a very exciting thing for the space industry. So before I get into an update on uh, Galactic and, and Orbit and TSC, I thought it was important to set the context of what an interesting moment this is for humanity and our relationship with space. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, Richard Branson's space stuff. I think uh, um, one of the leaders of Virgin Orbit, Steve, Steve Isley, is, is out there somewhere in the audience. I don't know, Steve, if you're out there somewhere, you can, you can wave. There he is. Um, so if you want to buy a, a flight to uh, space with uh, Virgin Orbit, feel, feel free to see him after. But um, we've had an exciting uh, few weeks at Virgin Orbit with the uh, Launcher 1 doing a captive carry of a, of a dry rocket. And we're really looking forward to an exciting next few months as we progress through the test flight program there. This will be a very low cost, dedicated platform for small satellites. And uh, the milestone of now integrating the vehicle with the pylon, with the, uh, with the uh, air launch pl 747 platform is a really exciting moment for, our, uh, for the company. Um, and as we move into the spaceship side, uh, the carrier aircraft has now flown about 260 times. That's a, just a sign of the robustness of the, of the White Knight 2 platform. And uh, Spaceship Unity has completed uh, 14 flights now. Um, uh, our last uh, uh, supersonic flight went up to about Mach 2.49, 170,000 uh, feet. And uh, the next few flights will be even more exciting. And I think uh, we'll be seeing uh, some of those soon. Um, we have a short video of uh, the last uh, flight, which maybe we could just uh, show briefly now, if, if that's uh, possible. Um,
police are completely clean. Switches are coming clean. All right, so their handle's coming out. Beautiful black sky. There's a million dollar view out the window, Dave. Maybe the all first, Dave. Okay, so yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, 2019 is gonna be a huge year for human spaceflight in particular. And the idea that not just one, not just two, not just three, but potentially four human spaceflight vehicles will be flying from American soil in 2019 is something that I think the American public has not truly grasped, but I think they will, and what a year I think it will be next year as we and others begin commercial uh, human spaceflight from American soil again. Um, uh, and, uh, and we're looking forward to carrying on uh, in some small, very modest way, the legacy of the space shuttle having a, a horizontal um, landing uh, for our uh, customers. Um, the next two spaceships uh, are in construction now in Mojave. Uh, this was taken a couple months ago, so there's some progress, which I'll show you, um, being made. Um, and those are being done by an entity that I'm the head of called the TSC, or the Spaceship Company. That is a fully integrated design, manufacturing, and test company, which does airframe design, propulsion, ground material, flight test, low-rate manufacturer, and post-delivery support. It's an amazing group of several hundred people in Mojave, California, and I'm very proud of the work that they have done to build that vehicle, VSS Unity, and the next two uh, spaceships, which will be coming down the road. Um, they are also the entity that's manufacturing the rocket motors, the hybrid rocket motors for the spaceship, uh, and you see their picture of the, of the, essentially the wing box that was recently taken on that. I wanted to close with a little bit of a look towards the future, and um, I'll do that via the lens of spaceports. Um, uh, very happy to have uh, our partners from Italy as well as Cornwall um, in the audience. Um, uh, Spaceport America, just uh, the next state over in southern New Mexico, has uh, had a lot of progress. Uh, right now, we're in the final phase of fitting out the interior of the spaceport as well as some remaining uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, the road out to the spaceport from the south has been paved, and so all the infrastructure is really in place um, now, uh, and we're finishing a couple of last projects, fuel farm and a few other things, but it's going to be an exciting uh, 2019 as all that work is, is finished out. Um, I thought I'd spend just a, another moment on uh, Italy, since we have such a uh, strong delegation from Italy here at this conference. Um, we made an announcement uh, earlier with uh, partners from Alltech and Citael and the local governments um, in southern part of uh, Italy about our intention to uh, bring uh, eventually a, uh, a suborbital system to southern Italy. We think that that is a very exciting and beautiful place to operate. Um, our home base will remain in New Mexico. Um, but having a network of spaceports around the world has our, always been our ambition. And I think the idea of being able to bring um, space access to different countries around the world is one of the things that is um, very attractive uh, about our, uh, our, uh, our, our uh, system, and I think uh, it's a highly transportable one. Um, which I think will uh, be exciting to people around the world. And, you know, the idea of going up to space altitude and looking down and seeing the Rio Grande, um, you know, from, uh, uh, from 
from over New Mexico and uh, seeing, um, uh, you know, the boot of Italy is, uh, is a really exciting thought uh, that we can all sort of think about in the future. Um, where does this lead? I think for us, we envision uh, someday a network of spaceports that could serve as the foundation of an intercontinental um, system of, of uh, high-speed transport. It's, I think, frankly ridiculous that we're still going Mach 0.8 uh, over 50 years into the jet age. And uh, I think it's time that we start going quicker. We think that uh, rocket-propelled vehicles are one way to do that. And you can imagine that these spaceports, which will begin as uh, rides up to space, could soon uh, eventually be uh, rides across continents to other places, forming really the basis of an intercontinental um, uh, network that would serve uh, humanity and bring us all closer together. Um, so that's uh, our update today. I think uh, we'd like to keep the, pro the, the program moving, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But it's a great pleasure to be with you all. Houston is, of course, the really the heart of, uh, of NASA's human spaceflight program. We appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.